So we are uh, we, we are endeavoring to talk about topics that uh, I think that we haven't um, necessarily focused on. Um, there there's a there's a lot of uh, talk about harm reduction. There's a lot of talk about uh, human rights. We talked about that last night. Um, we you know we've talked about government overregulation and blind ideology and things like that. But there's a certain topic that uh, I think that it bears uh, it it bears a, a, a time for our scrutiny. Um, it should. It should be something that uh, is right on everybody's mind. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about neurodiversity. We're going to be talking about nicotine and what uh, benefits people that are neurodiverse. And we're going to explain some terms um, that, uh, that you may not know. Uh, I didn't always know these words myself. Um, I am neurodiverse, but uh, I, I never actually used that label until uh, Dr. Charles Gardner brought it to our attention. Um, and you're going to find out that a lot of the the most passionate voices about this uh, vaping technology, about clean nicotine, are people that are on this spectrum of, uh, of the neurodiverse. Um, and some of us have multiple, uh, multiple uh, things that... Uh, make us need or uh, want nicotine. But hey, before we get too deep into this, uh, let's bring in my my brother from another mother, Kevin. I'm just here for the for the food. There's food? <laughs> no, there's I missed, no food. I missed food. I missed food. So, Hi, Patrick. Um, I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm 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 proud to represent Son of Liberty. Hey, you've got you don't know nicotine and I've got the uh, nicotine enhanced T-shirt on tonight because uh, right there. I think that I think that we should point to people, point out for people that uh, nicotine does uh, it does supercharge our brains. Mm -hmm. um, it does amazing things. So um, anyway, we've got we've got uh, three guests um, that we yes. know. Um, yes. There's Skip. There's lovely Skip. There's <sighs> Richard and uh, Kath. Uh, is supposed to be here. I sent her the link. She replied. So she might be coming in a minute. So, uh, hey, Skip has been nagging us forever to come on the show. <laughs> You're enjoying this, aren't you? I, I am. I love spending time with, with you. And and Richard. Uh, Richard's already been on our show, uh, but uh, we enjoy Richard. I am jealous that Richard got to go to London this week to the yes. to the rally um, in London and hang out with our friends. Um, Dr. Charles Gardner was there. I see there was lots of fun people there. And Richard was there. What's going on, yeah. Richard? Um, it was a brilliant event considering, obviously, COVID restrictions and things. There weren't as many people there as there would have been. But yeah. yes, it was absolutely brilliant to go and meet Dr. Gardner. He was, he's a fantastic advocate for us. Yeah, and yes. I don't know how he does it, where he finds the energy to carry on as he does. Mm -hmm. But um, to, to uh, help keep his energy up, I did manage to uh, donate him a bottle of my uh, homebrewed mead, which was... Um, Dr. Gardner's elixir for what ails you. Uh huh. I saw the tweet. <laughs> the I saw the tweet. So there, there was something else. Uh, apparently, uh, Skip cried. What? Oh, apparently, the, apparently, Skip cried. This, the small award that we got, though, it's absolutely um, blew me away. I, uh, I mean, honestly, we don't deserve it, but it's just a wiki. Uh, well, hey, to... <laughs> okay, you say it's just a wiki. Yes. Uh, just a wiki. But uh, Kevin and I couldn't do a wiki. Um, what, what exactly was the award? Um, I should have brought it with me, shouldn't I? But unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's actually still packed. I literally came back from London, 
grabbed a couple of hours sleep and then jumped on the live stream. Oh, yeah. so thank you. Well, thank you I for that. I actually unpacked. So, but but so, what was the award for? Um, services for... to the vaping community for the nice. Safer Nicotine Wiki team. Nice. For contributions to tobacco harm reduction. Excellent. Excellent. Well, deserved. one of these days, one of these days, Kevin and I are going to get a chucklehead award for that. <laughs> oh, Maybe. I want to order you one. She's going to present it. <laughs> She's going to bonk in me person. in the head with it. Yeah. She's going to get one of those ones with the big marble base and just walk up behind me and kabonk. Like when it's cat. 30 below would be a good time to go to Texas and visit you. Well, it, it doesn't get 30 below here. So you're. But you, it does here. Yes, it does in Minnesota. I didn't put my t-shirt on, but I too have a t-shirt for tonight. It says do. science because figuring things out is better than making stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, can you send one of those to Stanton Glands, please? <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> so today, today we've had a pretty, a pretty, uh, a pretty good panel of people on during the day today. There's been a lot of a lot of good people on. There's been a lot of good people on every day that we've done this. Um, um, Ignacio was on um, earlier. Uh, well, our day and their day are completely different. I'm, um, you know, uh, so there, there's been a whole bunch of stuff. But tonight, and this is a topic that all of us are. Are pretty good talking about uh you know kevin has the unique situation of having a spouse uh that benefits from nicotine because she has uh, alzheimer's um he has a son that's on the spectrum uh skip and richard and i are all of us somewhere on that same spectrum um and uh we're going to talk about how nicotine um affects us but uh, uh, here's a quick few little facts so um, 71 percent of adults with schizophrenia use nicotine smoke uh, 60 percent with bipolar disorder smoke 40 percent um, ADHD or autism smoke um, and then in the general normal population only 14 percent of the general population smokes so just looking at those quick numbers um, pretty much show you who the main, uh, purchasers and smokers are, but then you go to the CDC's website. I'm going to share this real quick. I've shared this on um, the show when we had Dr. Charles Gardner on the show um, because we were reading each other's mind and uh, he was talking about this exact uh, stuff when we uh, had him on the show. So this is directly from the the CDC's website, uh, and when the producer will share it, we'll we'll share it on screen. But I'll still read it anyway. Um, so the heading is tobacco use and quitting among individuals with behavioral health conditions, um, which I don't like that head. I don't like that title at all. But anyway, um, so mental health uh, disorders, blah, blah, blah. Um, here's a horrible list of, of things that uh, people are demonized for um, substance and they, and they throw they throw substance users, substance use disorders in amongst us, the you know people that are on the spectrum. Um, so they're saying one in four adults in the U.S. have some form of mental health condition. And 40% of all cigarettes that are consumed are consumed by people in these categories. And these are just the U.S. numbers. Now, this doesn't include um, other people that are living um, in poverty. It doesn't include people that are living in um, bad situations, uh, abusive situations, stressful situations. Um, the, those people also fall into that. The, the LGBTQ uh, population also have higher smoking rates. Um, so uh, these are all things that we need to pay attention to. Um, but specifically uh, during the late, the latest uh, Truth Initiative campaign, their uh, depression stick, uh, their whole campaign is based on a model or a theory that the use of the, of nicotine causes these problems they're putting the, they're putting the chicken in front of the egg we use these pro we use these products to minimize the problems with our 
issues. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Kevin, or not Kevin, I, I'm used to calling your name first. Richard, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your your story. Okay, uh, so I have uh, multiple diagnoses. Uh, the main one is autism spectrum disorder. Um, I also have ADHD, both of which were not diagnosed until I was 47 years old. And I've known that I wasn't quite the same as everybody else. Oh, sorry, I forgot one as well. Um, I also have schizophrenia or paranoid schizophrenia, which uh, is probably the most difficult one to, to live with and to actually function through. Um, I've known I was a bit different pretty much all my life from other people. And even when I smoked, I used to smoke 60 a day because I just couldn't seem to get enough nicotine. Um, Nowadays, I use 48 milligram or 50 milligram nicotine pouches. And that actually is enough nicotine for me that um, I get enough to treat the symptoms that I get, particularly the ADHD symptoms are so vastly improved by nicotine that it's just not true. I I don't understand how um, people can take the, the meds which are prescribed when nicotine is actually so much better, at least from my point of view, for treating the symptoms. Because they, they give you basically amphetamines. Mm-hmm. And uh, the problem with that is you take them in the morning and then even if you wanted to try and snooze or something during the afternoon, you can't because you're all amped up on these long acting amphetamine type drugs. So if you didn't have nicotine, if you didn't have it, if you didn't have the patch, what would you, what would it be like for you? Um... Well, I'd be a lot more um, kind of, I don't know, it's hard to describe how ADHD makes you feel because it's not what people think it is. It makes you feel kind of almost panicky and um, like you have you know what needs to be done but you can't actually get it together in your brain to put the tasks into order and divide them up into little bits so you can actually get on with it Mm -hmm. it's a it's a very strange thing unless you've experienced it to actually try and get your head round (laughs) but i think um, think three of us have the adhd uh, uh sign for sure, um, yes. But you have you you have other things that compound it. I mean, I have multiple diagnoses. My diagnoses are: I don't have schizophrenia. I I do. I have been you know diagnosed bipolar, ADHD, and obsessive compulsive, which is already a wicked bad combination. Um, yeah. But uh, working with patients, I you know I I work with patients that are you know, paranoid schizophrenic. Um, Their world is a completely different world than ours. And your world is a completely different world. It's not. My world is is a completely (laughs) different world because um, that's one of the things, and I'd say that's the hardest thing to live with, uh, just simply because the drugs you have to take to make it not be a problem are a big problem um nicotine is a game changer on that front Mm -hmm. because the drugs i need to take for the schizophrenia are very sedating and that's part of the reason that i have the the adderall as well is Mm -hmm. because of the the highly sedating drugs that i need to take 
I honestly could not function without nicotine. Nicotine is a stimulant, mm -hmm. but it's short acting, which means if I want to go to sleep or take a nap or something, I just don't have nicotine for an hour. Mm. And then it's out of my system. I can go to sleep. If I take yeah. the Adderall, then I'm awake for the whole day, whether I like it or not. And and it also makes the ADHD symptoms kind of different, not worse or better. Um, it kind of brings out anxiety. It brings out, which nicotine doesn't do. Nicotine actually answers. reduces anxiety. Yeah. Um, how did you how did you realize it was nicotine that was helping you? Um, when I tried to give up smoking on one of the many occasions I've tried to give up smoking, mm -hmm. and I went from 60 cigarettes a day to a 21 milligram patch. Yeah. Um, I suddenly realized that I was smoking because I was treating symptoms, not mm -hmm. And the nicotine patch just wasn't enough nicotine. Right. Right. A 21 milligram patch when you're a 60 a day smoker is a drop in the ocean. Um, I took Adderall uh, when I first got my diagnosis and having, having you know, a little bit of, uh, well, it was manic depressive when I first got diagnosed with bipolar. That's what they called it then. Um, I actually... Uh, had heart palpitations, all sorts. My anxiety was magnified because of that. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah I get that. It does the same to me. And um, I also get, you can get palpitations just because it's a strong stimulant. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it, it changes the way your body acts. Mm -hmm. And you can get quite um, sort of hyper and be out of tune with other people around you because suddenly your head's going 90 to the dozen and everybody around you is going, what on earth are you on? And I'm on medicine. Nicotine, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you explain to them, you know, it's medicine to treat my diagnoses. And they go, okay, where can I get some? <laughs> but nicotine doesn't do that. Nicotine actually no. reduces my anxiety. It puts me on a level more close to normal people. And where I can interact with them and I can actually have a conversation without you know going off on a tangent every five seconds it's really you know it was a complete game changer to discover vaping and i vape quite high nicotine liquid i i use a 90 watt box mod and i vape 48 milligram liquid wow so that's <laughs> I mean, what you need but is what you get. Do. I mean, wow. I mean, that would that would shoot the back of my head would probably shoot out with that high wattage and that high name. I could do either or. I don't think I could do both. Um, Skip. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay, so I started smoking when I was ten. Um, why wait? I mean, if you're gonna, you're gonna. Can you hear me? Yes. No. <laughs> um, I was a unique child. I had a lot of unique behaviors. Um, back then, they didn't know that autism was a thing. So um, I suffered a lot of child abuse because my dad didn't like me doing things like flapping my hands and uh, just went through life trying to learn how to people um, 
video of all the ice bed, I suddenly became very depressed. Um, I did a really good job of hiding it. I don't think any of you ever would have guessed. And uh, after Aaron came up and showed me the uh, You Don't Know Nicotine movie and I talked to him for a bit, we figured out that something wasn't right. And um, I was planning on how I was going to die and didn't seem abnormal to me. Uh, some help. And I got diagnosed with depression, ADHD, autism, and uh, I got a new know of PTSD. So all that happened when I stopped using nicotine and was totally unaware that I had been self-medicating since I was 10. Um, I now vape way higher nicotine than I ever vaped, and I've been vaping since 13. There are so many passionate people that are in this community that are part of this uh, advocacy thing that we do that are that are right in the same situation as us. You know, we talked about on on the Son of Liberty show, we, we talk to or interview vapors from around the world and compare how their quit stories are so similar to our quit stories. But then when we start talking to other vaping advocates and we start talking about neurodiversity and, and the beneficial aspects of nicotine, and the next thing you know, we find out their stories are almost exactly like our stories too. Um, it is it is amazing. Yeah, it is. Um, weirdly enough, my story of smoking is pretty much the same as Skip. I also started at 10 years of age and um, also did the thing of titrating down nicotine to zero. Mm -hmm. And suddenly finding that I was having, you know, huge problems with everyday life, which I didn't have when I was on nicotine. So I titrated the nicotine back up to a point beyond where it was when I was smoking. And I'm actually much better for it than taking the things if i took every drug i was prescribed i'd be a zombie who just sat in a corner somewhere and dribbled mm -hmm. because yep been there done that <laughs> and yes it's it's not a good look is it no it is it is definitely not um those meds that that they put you on for all of the things that that you have you know oh well, you have this so you need this combination of meds oh you have this uh so take these ones and then oh oh you have this so uh here's another pill and then you find out that the cocktail that you're taking um makes you a completely different person it, it you know yes. it saps your will um you're like you said a zombie um i mean I, you, I'm you, really... you, you can't motivate yourself to do anything I mean, I'm really lucky at the moment. I found a really good doctor who is willing to let me dictate what I take and how much of it, mm -hmm. and also supports the use of me using nicotine in place of things like Adderall and those kind of things to actually better treat my symptoms. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so lucky to have that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times you get clinicians that really are very, uh, well, they're not very creative thinkers. Um, and, and, and they're not really willing, you know, we always talk about meeting the person that we're treating or the, the, the pe people that are governing us should meet us where we are. It's the same thing with our medical clinicians. Um, yes, so, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right. So we had heard uh, your story all the way to the point where you had uh, talked to Aaron and, and found out that you had been, uh, you know, late diagnosed with a lot of issues. And I had asked um, if uh, you were managed or if you were feeling okay while you were vaping with nicotine. Um, and then you titrated to zero, lowered your, your nicotine to zero, and then all of your symptoms came is that is that, a, is that right 
they blew up in my face afterwards. I mean, now that I know what I have, it's obvious to me that I've, I've had those challenges my whole life. I just never realized it until, um, until the depression hit. I, so yeah, now I vape way higher nicotine and I'm doing much better. Um, much better. Much better. And, um, are you are you on a uh, a plethora of of meds or um, is it just easily main, maintained and managed with just the nicotine? I refuse to go on meds, and some people have an issue with that. Um, I have a lot of trauma from my past that was never ever dealt with, and while I was going through therapy, I really wanted to just deal with things on my own. I'm very med sensitive. I often have really bad side effects to medication. So I take as few meds as possible. Um, the only thing that we worry about is if I slip back into a depression, um, not being on medication for that. So I have to be very aware of what's going on in my head and just flat out tell people when I'm not doing well. and quit being so dang independent and accept help when I need help. Well, and that's why we have Mark. <laughs> Actually, believe it or not, I have not told my husband or my son about this. But they're still able to participate in helping you. Yes. Um, my husband's a very good man. I Obviously, know. He takes he's great here. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He has a good sense of humor, um, but he is a very loving and supportive person. So he's very intuitive if if I'm extra quiet or extra crabby or, you know. And, yeah. and last night when you were watching the scope stream and you fell asleep on the couch. Yeah. Your loving husband got your cell phone and typed in the chat. Uh, this is Mark. Uh, Skip has fallen asleep. Um, and her battery is running down. How do I turn this off? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's way better than a picture. And and I, I, I didn't think quickly enough to type in there. You take a picture of your wife asleep on the couch <laughs> and I will teach you how to. I, somebody else responded in the chat room before before I could do this. I mean, I wasn't thinking on my feet. I was I was enjoying the stream and I was like, dang it. That was a missed opportunity. I'm so glad. I'm but, so glad. He promised no more pictures. I don't think he's taken any in a while, though. But uh, no, but uh, I just thought that it was quite lovely that he felt comfortable. Like he knew who we were. Like he knew the people. Like he feels comfortable, like telling the world, hey, this is Mark. How do I turn my wife's phone off? Like, <laughs> he felt like he was one of us, you know. That's good. I talk about you guys a lot. Um, I go home and talk about nicotine and vaping and. Well, in one of the in one of the uh, uh, Twitter feeds, like he was responding. Oh, I know who you are. You're the guy on the TV. Ah, uh, yes. Because <laughs> every every Friday, if I don't work, I go home from the shop and quickly make supper and try to take a quick nap so I can watch Son of Liberty Radio, and he's always watching TV. So I have my headset on so I can hear the computer, and then he has his wireless headset so he can watch TV, and we sit there side by side in our own little world doing our thing. So, yeah, he's very familiar with all you guys. But you're together. So yes, that is, we are. So that is quite lovely. Um, We've been together since uh, 1984. George Orwell. Okay. Um, so, uh, Skip, the, you know, a lot of people, you know, specifically, uh, you, you're, you know, Fig. Um, uh -huh. uh, our friend Fig uh, was uh, in the Middle East um, and uh, was in, our, in the military. And he came back with a case of PTSD. And, you know, he, he would be the first to say that if I didn't have nicotine, my PSD, my PTSD would be uh, way worse, way more debilitating. Um, and, uh, you know, when um, Dr. Uh, Glover was on the show, Mara was on the show and talking about in New Zealand 
and there's one of the one of the clips, one of the short clips that that we're using during scope from our show is her uh, mentioning discussing the fact that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, spousal abuse uh, that New Zealand has has issues with uh, women being abused, um, children being abused, and uh, that that is one of the reasons why in certain communities in New Zealand the the smoking rates are higher. Um, I believe that in a heartbeat. Matter of fact, it was big. Um, he used to talk to me like two, three, four in the morning when I was at work at the group home and I was struggling one day and he was online and asked him if he could chat. And it was actually him that pointed out the possibility that I might have PTSD and told me I should ask my therapist about that. So yeah, he's a good guy. I Love miss him. Thing. Love yes. him. He's so busy. He, he, he uh, basically started a new life and uh you know i still see him periodically on on the medias but uh he, he will always be our brother you bet um, good guy so uh richard um whose idea was the safer wiki thing um i think it was mine i'm pretty sure it was mine um i mean it was just i was sat there thinking about what could i do what gap in the market was there in the safer nicotine space for something and i kind of came up with the idea initially of doing a website that would just be a resource a library of all the scientific information that we have that everybody every advocate seemed to have their own um you know, google doc or um their own filing system of information. And it was just to, to try and bring that all together into one place. And in the end, um, I was browsing the internet, came across Wikipedia, found out that the software they're using is free to use. Mm -hmm. And I happen to have a home server anyway. For my own like vanity domain basically and i thought well why not i'll install the software i'll get it up and running that way everybody can contribute who wants to contribute and we can gather together all the information put it in one place so that advocates have somewhere to link to that's easy to link has all the information and is like a central hub for for everything that we do mm -hmm. it's it's an astounding feat you've you've done and are continuing to do to me there's a oh, lot yes. of information I mean, in there we wouldn't I mean, have the wiki without richard um we were just looking up the history the other day it was uh november 23rd of last year Alan Beard tweeted looking for studies and a bunch of people responded. And that's when we all became aware that people all over the world are collecting data. And he started a chat on Twitter and we were like, we need some place to put it. And none of us have technical skills. And Richard went, I do, I do. Um, and it would have, it would have never have happened if Richard didn't have those skills and have the equipment or the means to buy the equipment that he needed to set it all up. And since then, every um, technical glitch we've had, Richard's been the one that's had to fix it. He's the one that backs up our system. He's the one that updates our system. He is our IT guy. Um, our chat has, I can't remember, it's either 26 or 28 people from around the world. They're all consumer advocates. and. Uh, <clears throat> they all participate in one form or another. Um, some of us do the majority of the actual creation of material on the site, but everybody participates as far as gathering information or um, input on how to do things or how to deal with situations or, you know, we all suffer from burnout now and then picking each other up. Um, 
discussing our neurodiversity issues because there are several of us that that face those types of challenges. So it's become an amazing uh, international team effort. It's really cool. Yeah, and we couldn't do it without each other. Um, Amen. The, every, everybody on the team has their strong points and their weak points, and we prop each other up. Well, and I'm I, I'm quite happy to do the technical stuff. I find it easier to talk to computers than I do to people. I don't know um, why that is, but it's. I think that's an autism thing, because computers are set out in such a way they operate in such a way you know exactly what to expect um you can focus on the task at hand and you know it's it's just my thing so i'm quite happy and pleased to be able to give something to the community that they can use i think yeah. that's the driving force for all of us um we all have experienced loss due to smoking. Um, some of us face health issues due to smoking. Um, and we've all fought hard for harm reduction products. And it's nice to be able to provide advocates around the world with information that they can use to help educate the public, their doctors, lawmakers, um, my therapist was totally against nicotine use, um, and just recently she helped me in a Zoom meeting um, discuss nicotine with two very concerned parents whose 17-year-old had started vaping. And as they described how their child changed when he started vaping, I told them I thought he had ADHD. And um, she went and read a whole mess of our materials on the wiki and educated herself about nicotine and actually had a meeting with those parents and encouraged them to have their son tested. And guess what? He was self-medicating. That child has ADHD. So now his parents are supporting him and helping him um, instead of punishing him. So that was a really cool little side thing that came out of that, that wiki project. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's brilliant. We, we learn things about ourselves. Um, I mean, obviously, that that we use to help other people. Um, and the the sad part is, is in most communities, um, people that are on the spectrum, people that are neurodiverse, people that have bipolar disorder, people that have schizophrenia are othered. I mean, in many places, it's still... Uh, it, it's still not something that people talk openly about. You know, they don't, they're embarrassed by it or, or, uh, you know, they feel demonized by it. And, and, and the thing is, is um, I, I don't know who said it a while ago, but, uh, you know, being neurodiverse is just a superpower because um, when, when something is taken away, something else is amplified. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. That just means that I'm very ordered. And if something is if something is out of order, then one of the other problems kicks in, and then I'm agitated until I put it in order. So oh. <laughs> I've, call, I've called you a few other things. It's funny you, yeah. you, you the the ashamed or embarrassment, um, especially when you're young. And you're you're ultra aware of what other people are thinking of you, and people of our age, well, I'll use that term loosely, mm -hmm. uh, care le care a little less, in my opinion. But but like with my son, at at 26 now, at, at 21 or so, when he was you know officially diagnosed, it 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 was hard for him to understand because I'm weird, I'm different, whatever, and superpower is a great thing i can actually use that with him um it's it's not to be ashamed of it it takes a lot for people that have been through things all their lives who who care a little less like us and say hey kiss my butt this is how i am and this is why i'm doing this when you have a child doing it 
and a website of all things brings the doctor and the parents from from people like us who have already been shunned as smokers into the forefront of saying hey this child has an issue let's let's dig a little deeper so i i give kudos to the doctor for listening with you skip and then and then proceeding until she figured it out that's that's even more beautiful and it shows how powerful people like us you know those people are so richard and alan because he's always trouble uh, uh sparking that interest um and then you guys doing what you do is is just a, a stepping stone for pro-human you know yep. that's what it is it's it's very true uh it's my therapist that suggested i try salts um so that i could vape a higher nicotine because um the regular nicotine the real high is just too harsh and i can't handle vaping it um and the difference in my adhd is amazing i mean i still struggle i have a lot of struggles with um emotional regulation um starting a task is hard um <laughs> finishing a task is hard i i'm very prone to falling into rabbit holes uh <laughs> But it's, it's amazing. You know, I have worked with people with disabilities my whole life. My brother's learning disabled. My husband's learning disabled. My father-in-law was learning disabled. Um, I work in a group home. I provide services for people with disabilities. I've been a very vocal advocate for disabilities my whole life. And yet when I got diagnosed, um, I should have felt relieved to finally know why I'm different or why I do the things I do, but I was very, very embarrassed. And I, I, I don't even know why my head went there. I have four different times told a parent of a toddler that they should have their child tested for autism. And all four times I was right. How do I see this in other people wow. and never see it in myself other than it was my normal? And I didn't tell anybody for months after I got diagnosed. I finally, on a Facebook chat, told Matthew Milby my diagnosis. He was the first person I shared that with, and that was because he was sharing his personal story and I got comfortable. And the second person I told was Aaron, and I still wasn't vocal about it until um, Charles Gardner said, you know, you really need to, to, to go public and share your story because it'll help other people. And I, I like to be a helper. That's, that's my autism thing. I, I, that's very important to me to help. So it's amazing now that I have come forward and shared my story, how many people go, oh, me too, me too. And I now have a whole family of people that are just like me. And I've, I've never, ever had that my whole life. It is the coolest thing on earth to finally yeah. be somewhere where I'm not weird and I'm accepted. And well, when, I, I mean, I, I, I won't, I won't testify that you're not weird because, <laughs> weird. because <laughs> we sort of, we sort of wear that badge with honor or, okay. or cranky. Uh, I, I, I won't, you know, I still don't like what Kevin calls you. Um, <laughs> Guess because you're chicken. Uh, <laughs> it's a term of endearment. No, uh, one sir. Of the things, yes, Where I came from, gentlemen don't say that thing. <laughs> um, I have always liked people, even if I don't actually fit into their circle. I always say I put my sandbox next to somebody else's sandbox instead of playing in their sandbox but I, I i like people i like being helpful but i have a really super strong sense of right and wrong and when things are not right and i feel they're wrong my whole life i've had a reputation for what my family calls my poison pen and if you piss me off i take out my pen and um i can write not so nice things. And I think when I first started advocating for vapor products, um, there was so much wrong that I just needed to let everybody have it. Um, and now I'm trying really, really hard to push be kind because I've learned that um, 
if I be nasty to people, they're never going to listen to me and they're never going to change their minds. And I'm really tired of watching people die from smoking and dang it, I'm going to change some minds before I die. That's my bucket list. Well, you got another 100 years or so, so it'll be fine. I'm 63, my dear, and most of my family dies right around 70. No. So I actually feel that clock is ticking pressure. Like if you're going to make a difference in the world, then get off your tuchus and go out there and do something. When you, yeah. That doesn't mean you have to mark the calendar either. Plus no. you have to fill out an application. I think, in all honesty, that calendar was marked when I decided that my life wasn't worth living anymore. And uh, but I, burned, I burned that calendar. Um, I want to be here for a while. Good. Um, Absolutely. We want you to stick around, Skip. <laughs> yes. I'm not done giving Patrick a bad time yet. Now that I've been on his show, I have to find something new to give him a bad time about. I, I still I showed you receipts where you basically I, said I have a list. I have don't, a list. Make, <laughs> don't make me don't make me be on the show. But um <laughs> so you know, here here's here's the thing though. All of us um were kids, right? We were I mean I, I came out not fully grown. Um and in our childhood, at least here in the States, I don't know about the UK, um, but uh, when you go to school, the kids that are different, they're sequestered. They're, they're pushed away from the normal kids, um, almost like the adults think that what they have is contagious. Yes, absolutely. And it's, that's so wrong that it's not true because – d- Does we're... anybody – does anybody actually think that for the mental health of those children, that uh, that 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 doesn't make them feel like they're less than ashamed? Of course it does. Shunned. Of course it does. It's it's a ridiculous thing to do to to actually segregate people based on the fact that they're slightly different. The, the I mean, things have improved a lot recently in that things have got more inclusive there's still a long way to go but um back when i went to school which is quite a while ago now um (laughs) we were almost put into different classes and um looked down on by everybody else Mm -hmm. and heaven knows i should have ptsd because of that but somehow i've managed whether it's the nicotine or what somehow i've managed to avoid that well i mean but that, that's a, that's be, a that's a benefit but those of us that were diagnosed later like you know i i wasn't diagnosed until i was you know, oh i in, wasn't diagnosed in until I, was, I wasn't diagnosed until i was in my 40s hmm. so so th- um, that at least helped you when i was at school I was put into the, yeah, you know, the idiots class or the lower level class. Special needs because I had attitude problems and people thought that I was just being difficult and I wasn't. I was just being different. You were being uh, you, and luckily, yes. luckily, I had a mother who was. Um, uh, I, I, I might I might have some of my mother's personality traits. Um, she was my defender. Um, I was I was actually in all of the gifted classes. However, I didn't I didn't meet their cookie cutter uh, idea of what uh, of what should be. I wasn't I wasn't uh, I, I, I had long hair down to my backside. I had behavioral problems. But I came in and I, I scored higher than everybody around me. So they said he can't be cheating because he's scoring higher than everyone around him. I mean, um, it's it's weird that I was also in some of the the higher classes for things which um, interested you interested me because mm-hmm. of autism. You have special interests. So in electronics, physics, and biology. I was in the gifted class and why the school couldn't figure out that 
I was actually really very smart and very um, focused when I wanted to be, but that I had issues with focusing on things I wasn't interested in. But for some reason, they didn't actually ever figure that out. Yeah, and no. And they were in charge. You were just English. hyperactive. You were just that hyper kid. You were just, you know, that's that's what they used to call it. Or he's a daydreamer. Well, and yes, for those of us with autism that are older, um, when we were children, autism wasn't a thing. You were diagnosed with schizophrenia, but not autism. They didn't really start diagnosing autism until the 80s. And it's very common for females to not be diagnosed with autism or ADHD. Oh, yeah, but it's females until they're get adults. Autism, yes. Yeah, they do. Uh, but girls have a tendency to be more social and wanting to belong. So girls yes. have a tendency to observe behaviors and mimic them and mask their own. Um, masking is a huge thing for people with autism and causes quite a few of them to burn out. So they're compensating. Yeah, I, yeah. Are, are they compensating for the issues that they're having by mimicking the other yes. kid? Okay. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how I lived my life for years and years. Everything was a front. I mean, it was literally I put a mask on to go and interact with the world. Yep. And now the world can go to heck, and I'm just going to be myself because. Uh if i could it's... if i could highlight comments i would highlight bernie's uh comment there it says uh i was labeled anti-authoritarian um yes <laughs> that was me, me. too that, <laughs> see i was but a, yes I putting was on a agent. disguise playing a character in school that's what you do to get by yes yes i was an a student um i didn't get sent to special classes i was identified as a gifted student, um, but I had a single parent trying to raise two kids. And the gifted program was $15 for every subject you were gifted in, and my mom couldn't afford it. So I wasn't allowed to participate in gifted student programs. So yeah, you know, I was told to take classes like home ec and, and shop mm -hmm. and um, because that's what people were, from divorce families do were they, and were, wasn't were they trying, even encouraged hmm? I, I mean i don't want to sound ugly here but it sounds like they 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 were trying to make you butch yeah versus um versus was, addressing what was really wrong um i mean back then um they thought that that was a mental illness as well right um and uh you know thank god we've progressed but yeah i mean that seems like a ham-handed uh, <laughs> uh way a, of I, trying to trying to to solve your problem i was a hardcore tomboy so i well, liked taking wood shop I, and auto I, mechanics I, I thought um, the tomboys were sexy yeah i think they're sexy i don't know i can ride a harley can you <laughs> Yes, I can, I can rebuild a car engine. I, you know, I, I like mechanical things. I like knowing what makes things work. Um, oh, just naturally yes, curious. Absolutely. I, if I could just uh, figure out be... computers. The wonderful thing is, is that there are people in our chat room that are, that are talking along that are, that are participating who have very similar issues, very similar stories. I'm seeing Bruni. Um, I see Kath is in the chat room, and I sent her the link so that she could be here. But um, we're, we are actually running towards the end of our talk. Um, I, I did I did uh, appeal for more time, so we do have a little more time, guys. So we don't have to rush. Like last night, I felt rushed, and I didn't even need to. They were like, "You could have gone over," um, because I feel like there's still some things that we can talk about. Um, because obviously. Uh, when Dr. Glover was on the show, I'll refer back to Dr. Glover. Um, when Dr. Glover was on the show, she was talking about the um, fact that her daughter goes to a very good school in New Zealand um, and that uh, they one of the students committed suicide. Oh. And um, in the conversation, she dropped the, the statement that – and she wasn't even on the suicide list. 
Yes. And I said, I said they have a fucking suicide list. Yes. Uh, and 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 I didn't say fucking. I apologize. They they have a suicide list, and and they're not addressing. Um, they're not addressing these issues. They're just they're just what surveilling these people. They're 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 standing by and watching yeah, the downslide. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, ACE adverse childhood experiences. Kids that experience a lot of those, be it mental illness, poverty, abuse, uh, a parent with a substance abuse disorder, divorce, um, a parent that's incarcerated, you know, traumatic experiences where you're not just having a free, carefree childhood. Those kids have the highest tendency to smoke, to drink, to do drugs, to have risky sex. And yet we're going to ban this and ban that and change the age of this or that and slap a Band-Aid on all these societal problems instead of addressing the issues that drive kids to that to the first place. Well, you and, know, why don't they and, ask kids, why do you smoke? Sure, some of them want to be cool or their friends are doing it, but some of them feel so bad they're looking for something, anything to make them feel better. And why don't we do anything about that? And would they so, be able to answer the question that it makes me feel better when when I smoke or whatever? Last February. Yes, I mean, I, I, I could have told you that from the age of 10, yeah. that yeah. smoking made me feel more able to fit in and better able to cope with the things that life threw at me. I was another one of these people who was on the suicide list at school because, um, you know, I had some fairly serious issues, which at that time were undiagnosed. And one of the things I used to do was to self-harm. And instead of actually taking me aside and saying, look, what's going on? They just put you on this list and keep an eye on you. And it makes you feel even more singled out for you know the wrong kind of attention to be yes. put on that list right. yes. rather than somebody actually helping that's yeah. one of the things that makes me most angry about my life is i'm a kid who fell through the cracks i was an a student and didn't graduate from high school you know i could have my mom was low income i could have gotten a degree in anything i could be making a hundred grand this year instead of walking around with half my teeth missing. Why didn't anybody notice I needed help, that something wasn't right, you know? Because that's that's too difficult and it costs money. That's the problem, is that people, I don't know, I, I go out of my way to help people to do the right thing. But a lot of society just mumbles along and they just do the bare minimum they can do to get by. I don't understand that attitude at all. So last March, um, I did a, a, a series of tweets and I, I've shared it uh, if I don't know who's in the back office right now. But um, March 22nd, I sent a tweet out and, and the text is uh, uh, every day I was I was posting a, a picture of a vape or whatever and then a topic. And I said, uh, we need to change the narrative. Um, ask why people smoke instead of blaming them. Uh, stress, depression, fear of the future drive them to smoke. Uh, vaping helps them handle these situations, giving them clean nicotine without killing them. We need to ask people why. Amen. Yeah. I mean, that is the most, I mean, I mean, it's nine times out of 10. If you sat down and had a real conversation with somebody, with a kid um, that's that's smoking, not don't throw a survey in front of them. Look them in the eye, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, give them time, and say, "What's going on? Why? Why are you smoking? Why? What is this experience? Uh, why is it that you're seeking out this experience?" And they're not doing that. They're not approaching this this question from a place of compassion they're 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 attacking them you're you know 
your behavior is, is ir irresponsible. I mean, that's how they come at them. Uh, they, they automatically make them retreat back into themselves and close themselves off. Um, you're, they're not going, you, you're not going to get a, a, a real conversation with them because this is uh, – you've broken the rules. Yes, uh, you know, Kath is in the chat room. She says, no, they're, they're policing. And I'm pro-police, so don't get me wrong. I, I have – obviously, there are bad cops. There are good cops. I don't want to get into that conversation. But yes, they're going at this – from a position of you've done wrong and must be punished instead of saying why we're here and to talk to you. That's, um, the, that's the great difference between the way things are dealt with in, you know, modern society, things are improving. I, I, at least in the UK, they are. And that, there is a more compassionate approach now than there was early on. Uh, if you were caught smoking at school, they literally punish you. You got detention and that kind of thing. And it was, uh, then nobody thought to sit you down and ask, you know, why are you doing this thing? Because it helps me focus on my lessons. And somebody could have then said, Oh, it helps you focus. Maybe there's something, you know, going on here and we ought to look into it. But instead, it was literally, as you've said, uh, you know, you need to be punished. You need you've to broken stop the rules. doing what you're doing. Yeah. To add to that, Richard, it's also that smoking is bad and they don't understand that there is chemicals in there that are good for those people those children those adults included so it's already we already know everything there is to know about nicotine no we don't and you're you're doing something wrong and we don't like that and you're embarrassing me and you're embarrassing we must yourself. stop correct that. your behavior stop that right patrick do we have time to go back to depression for just a minute yes ma'am we do thank you um, I'm a few days away from a very sad day. Uh, last year, right around Thanksgiving, a, a good friend of my son's and mine named Jason Fugate committed suicide. Um, Jason was an amazing, amazing young man. Uh, a father, a husband, a hard worker. Uh, he had gotten a very rare uh, disease and his body quit absorbing nutrients and he lost like 80 pounds in a couple of months and he became unable to work um, in a lot of pain and his doctor told him to quit smoking <clears throat> and he did and he got worse and uh, I called him one day and I said hey come down to the shop I want to talk to you so my son and I convinced him to vape and his symptoms got better and he was able to eat a little bit of food and he gained a little bit of weight. And um, he was going from hospital to hospital trying to get diagnosed. They gave him medications for like Crohn's disease and those kinds of issues, trying to find something that would help him. And the only thing that helped him was the damn nicotine. Sorry, I'm swearing. And his doctor insisted that he quit vaping, that nicotine was bad for him. And he got depressed and he started talking about killing himself and he promised his wife um, that if he ever did such a thing, she wouldn't find him. And she was on the couch one night watching a movie and he was sitting on the floor uh, by her feet playing some video game. And she woke up in the middle of the night and he wasn't there and she found him hanging in the garage. It's been really rough yes. losing him. And I go on Twitter and I see them stupid ads for them depression sticks. Yes, the that truth, makes me absolutely wild. The I, Truth Initiative program. I am so angry that anybody would actually admit on your website that you don't have proof and spend how much money on them stupid ads 
and someday some kid who's in trouble and needs help is going to think he can put down his stupid vape and he's going to be okay. And what are people going to think when that child kills himself because nobody helped him and he thought nicotine was his problem? I exactly. have never seen um, anything that's... so irresponsible in my whole life. It's ridiculous. I mean, I'm I'm going to make an ad admission here that I haven't really told anybody, but I deal with suicidal ideation every day. Every day I think about killing myself, and every day I took myself out of it. And without nicotine, that would be so much more difficult. That's that's just the way. The world is for me and it has been ever since i can remember and yes the depression stick campaign drives me wild it's it's denigrating to people who are depressed it's the it's ridiculous the sick the sick the sick matter is is that um it's not sick matter the the amazing fact of the matter is is that we have people like dr charles gardner um, who will talk to Kevin and I, who will come on our show. Because the last time he was on the show, if you watch the show, he actually predicted that this would happen. In the show, bef this is b months before the Depression Stick campaign came out. He said, yes, you that. watch, they're going to have a study that shows that people that have these problems, depression, and he named all these different things, uh, use these pro these products, and then and then they're going to say that using these products cause these problems. Yep. And then yep. months later, it, it's actually one of the clips that uh, the scope has. It's um, it drives me crazy that we are able to call their shots. We're able to to tell you what plays they're going to make in advance, and there's nothing that we can do about it. We know what they're going to do. Um, you know, we've well, made predictions. Is... We've made predictions on our show that have been quite accurate about how regulation yeah, is going to happen here in the states. And people called us crazy when we said it. And here we are. They've done everything I told you they were going to do. It, it's and disgusting. Without it's repercussions. Disgusting. That's you know... part of the reason. That's part of the reason we need the wiki. Because yeah. we need to have the information at our fingertips so that we can beat this stuff and we can actually throw stuff back at them and say, no, what you're saying is wrong. <laughs> it really sucks. What you're saying is but, but not. Hey, the thing is, when we say you're wrong and here's the stuff, here's the background, here's the information, here's the science, people like the University of Bath who are respected uh, educators, respected academics, they turn around and shit on other respected advocates and other respected academics and educators because they don't agree with them. I mean, look what they're doing to Dr. Farsalinos. He has all of the science on his side, and they yep. still yes, discredit absolutely. him. Absolutely. Absolutely. But they're a ridiculous bunch. Bath TR is a joke, basically. They're so far out there. But they get that... republished. They, yes, they do. Because they're, because they're a, a university, they get more airtime than they should do, and nobody actually calls them out for being quite That's as fringe it. as they are. That's but they the are point. fringe. But yep. they as are... much as we call them out, we do. We don't of have course. the voice. Not and yet. We're it, working we on have, it. We have, we have the tools. We have the science. We have the data. The science is always on our side. A hundred years from now, we are going to be on the right side of history. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, it, you know, this is one, and you, you'll see me go from zero to pissed off really fast. That's <laughs> definitely, that's definitely a symptom of my, uh, of my superpowers. Um, I can go from zero to like volcano really fast. The, the issue is, is that, uh, it feels like at times, um, and at one point we were there. We were at the throwing in the fucking hat and and walking away, and 
another advocate, a, a baby puppy advocate came in and woke us up with her passion. And that's why we're still here. But uh, you get frustrated after a while of fighting and fighting and fighting and never gaining an inch. Um, that's the point is we're here. Not only do we sit here uh, every weekend, Kevin and I do this. Every weekend we're sitting here fighting for the smokers. But we're also shining a light on the fact that some of those smokers don't have a choice other than uh, quit and have massive, massive issues. Yes. And dying. Yes. yes. Or becoming criminals just to maintain their fucking sanity. Yeah, I agree. For lack of a better word. I agree. It makes I... me angry too. That's that's what motivates me to carry on is the smokers out there who, you know, they're given the choice to quit or die, which is ridiculous when there are so many other options that they could take. And, you know, some people may be... <sighs> You know, need to use clean nicotine or mm -hmm. need to use something and the meds that the psychiatric doctors dish out to you sometimes make things worse or don't help or they can be you know, worse they can than the symptom. make your life a misery they and compound you, you, can actually have, you can actually have side effects which are worse than the symptoms you were suffering in the beginning which is absolutely crazy where yes. nicotine seems to be, and this is just purely from my own point of view, nicotine seems to be a wonder drug that lets me actually interact with the world on the world's terms and not freak out. Mm -hmm. And it's I need, really that seriously true. You, you that, need to tell I us mean, your I perspective. Would, you know, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, you know, this is the, the our community is the community that we should be amplifying. Um, because, yes, Chugga says in the chat room, in the neurodiverse community, I would suggest that odds are higher. It's a case of quit or die. Because, yes, it, you know, Richard, if Richard didn't have, see, for example, Richard was here in the States. And your nicotine patches is, is what did you say, Richard? Forty-eight milligrams. Uh, my nicotine patches are fifty oh, milligrams. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that you it, can. Those get, are um, are those legal in the UK? Uh, they're not illegal to possess or use. They're illegal to sell. There so, you go. Because they're over <laughs> the nicotine cap. Yes. My yes. my e-liquids, which I make myself, um, is illegal completely yes. because yes. it's over the nicotine cap. Yes. So no, I, I mean I thought you were saying nicotine patches. Um, oh yeah. Because... Um, you you can get nicotine patches up to twenty one milligrams. Right. So here in the states, that's the same thing. But in China and and other countries, you can get them all the way up to forty two milligrams. Yes. And all Probably. of the science. Yeah. All of the science shows that the higher concentrated nicotine patches are far more successful. Yes. So, but they don't tell you that. If, if, and you know, the truth of the matter is, two patches don't do the same thing. 221 no. milligram oh, no, patches no, 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 do no, not no, do no. the same thing as 142 milligram patch. They no. don't. And um, the, when, when I, when they, the first time that I tried to give up smoking, I went to the doctor and they tried to give me a three milligram patch uh. when I was a 60 a day smoker. And you can imagine exactly what happened. It just did not work. It didn't do anything. It was just not enough nicotine. You yes, know, exactly. exactly what it is. They already so, yes. know that the higher, I, I've used the words do not limit nicotine strength hundred times it's probably the uk silliness that started that in my head 
I might have stolen it from Alan Beard. I don't remember. Uh, you don't do that. A couple of years ago, they came out with higher nicotine strength does help smokers. Now, had I known that 10 years ago, maybe I'd have said, oh, okay, well, I'll do it. I did 21. It didn't work. I was so mad. I, I did two, about two and a half, three weeks, whatever it was, and I couldn't stand myself normally. No, my God, you don't think I'm easy to get along with now. I can't Jeez. stand you now. I know. I, I know you don't like me. But I agree that any way you can, if you're choosing to quit, is good. And if they're going to limit nicotine strength and scare the hell out of people to not take the nicotine that they want, need, desire, must have, whatever level that is where they are, like one of you two said earlier, then it's, it's futile. So here's a patch, 30 times you're going to try over your lifetime. How much harm reduction right. is that over 30 years? 7% yeah. success. I mean, I can't All you believe gonna do is that, it. yeah, the first first time I tried to give up smoking, the, the only things the doctor could offer me would be a three milligram patch or one milligram nicotine lozenges. Mm. And that just doesn't cut it. It's, you can't put five or ten of those in your mouth at one time. You could triple your dosage and still not have enough. Yeah. Like a chipmunk. Yeah. And, That's and the problem. I was taking, like, actually, you can put five of those in your mouth at once because that's what I was doing and chewing nicotine gum. <laughs> and it still wasn't enough nicotine. It wasn't right. until vaping came along and I actually got to mixing my own liquids and... I went, well, I'm going to give me as much nicotine as I actually want. <laughs> and suddenly I went from, you know, it took me a year of dual use to give up smoking because I did not want to give up smoking. I honestly, I, I didn't want to give up smoking. I enjoyed smoking. I liked smoking. And it made you feel it good. It made me feel <laughs> normal yeah and it wasn't until i actually got enough nicotine in an e-cig and back then i was using 60 milligram <coughs> in cigar like type e-cigs so i was mm -hmm. probably getting the same nicotine delivery as i'm getting now using 48 milligram liquid in a, a relatively high powered mod and i used to chain vape 60 milligram liquid in in 410 atomizers yeah yeah and i i came to this conclusion 2008 that i was just going to up the nicotine until i felt like i had enough and then within three weeks i think i'd given up smoking because i just didn't feel the need to buy any more tobacco it was simple as that and it was you've, a really weird thing to happen you found your limit you found your strength yeah yes and i yeah. titrated down my nicotine to zero and then i felt all strange and weird and peculiar and things got worse and i felt more suicidal and generally just didn't get on in life as well um at that point i was actually diagnosed at the age of 47 with all sorts of things which previously i would obviously had my entire life but nobody had actually taken the time to sit me down and figure out what was going on um and it's a case of no to heck with it i'm gonna go and buy some 50 milligram nicotine pouches I'm going to put 48 milligram nicotine in my 90 watt box mod because I need the nicotine. I, there's no reason not to have it because it's not going to kill me. And it helps. It really helps. And it really makes things better. These, are, these stories are the things that the experts that we all know don't listen, don't listen to, to us or anyone else for that matter. The, the experts that we know, that we the know. experts we know actually do, Kevin. Well, the ones we love, <laughs> they know. <laughs> the ones we don't, don't. 
Yes, but we're getting more and more of them. And I think we need to do a better job of amplifying the voices of the experts that do say that the world needs these harm reduction products. Um, yeah. You know, you look at what some of the people that we really care about are going through as scientists and academics, you know, they're being cut off from funding, they're losing their jobs. Like the one on Twitter said one time, you know, if I do this for my PhD and, and do a paper on harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction, am I committing career suicide? And why should any young person that's working on their future have to choose not to tell the truth about tobacco harm reduction for fear they won't find work and be able to support their families for the rest of their lives. Right. So we need to do better at, at giving them a voice. We, and, and I think that we've done a good job of that. I mean, obviously we've, we've interfaced. I mean, obviously uh, Cliff Douglas doesn't want to come on our show because we're small fish in the big sea. Um, but we, you know, Charles Cordemanche, uh, um, you know, that was a good show, by the way. I really liked that one. I mean, he he came from outside of our sphere. Like he's he's a financial dude. He's he's a he's a number cruncher. He's an analyst. Um, you know, obviously, we've had Mara Glover on the show. She's been attacked academically. Uh, Charles Gardner. Um, he he's he's going to be the next bullseye because uh, a he's you know at inco now you know he was part of smoke free world which everybody and anybody that's even slightly brushed against smoke free world um is going to is going to fall prey um but we've you know we we talked a little bit about it last night the who their their uh, constitution or their their declaration of human rights includes the right to health and yes. the right to human health and the right to having choice and there should of, be a in right, your health. There should be a right to harm reduction. Should be. I mean, and it there, seems is to me, in, there is in other fields. It seems to me. Drugs, well, yeah. you have a right to harm reduction. But it seems to me their their declaration of health, their declaration of human rights, their that document encompasses harm reduction. When you start reading their definitions that they've included on what they consider to be part of the right to good health, to health, and we're not only talking about health care, which is covered in there, but they're talking about quality of life. They're talking about yes, uh, being included in the choices and the decisions that are made about what they're you know what is allowed and then yes. obviously the fctc article 1d specifically names harm reduction as part of their mission yes and Robert, if you go to the world health world organization hey, but, but they they couldn't get any further away from harm reduction if they tried no but if you go they, if they you think of their just documents Yes, I know. I've read documents, it. I, I... It specifically, if you type in harm reduction on their website, yes, many, many hits will come up about drug policy, will come up about all sorts of harm reduction that they've embraced. Yes, absolutely. But why they seem in, totally incapable of embracing harm reduction for tobacco. And it's the setting fire to tobacco that contains the harm. The, as far as vaping goes, the risks are so much lower that they might as well not be there at all, really. Um, I mean, at least 95% safer. And that's when they, when they say that, I always try and make sure that I get the at least in there because it's probably more like 99.9% .9 safer. I mean, they're definitely it's, being conservative. I mean, the, the UK government are brilliant for coming out with the 95% safer figure. But yes, they're being, con they're being extremely conservative. And the, yeah. the risk of snooze 
and nicotine patches is probably even lower than vaping mm -hmm. to the point where you can say zero you know you're taking more risk by crossing the road or taking a bus or going to london as i just did and have just got back from and you know, having a drink is more risky than using nicotine pouches. I'm I'm sure of it. And mentioned we... Richard. <laughs> was was Norbert <laughs> Zillatron there, by the way? Yes, he was. Yes, he was there. Yep, okay. he had his Sweet. his holsters on display as per usual. And his collection of vaping equipment. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, there were there were a good few people there who, and they're all hardcore advocates, and you know they they actually got some people to take notice. I, there's the shame of you know having COVID going on that there couldn't be more people there, but we weren't the only ones. There's a van driving around round parliament square round and round and round with boris back back vaping on it in you know 10 foot high letters and so we're not the only ones who are who are trying to catch the attention of the government and i think we did we certainly uh they certainly caught the attention of bloomberg um apparently there were frantic transatlantic phone calls going on and police and security Good. getting very nervous about this protest. Good. And no, no. That, I, we should never have called it a protest, though. This is a rally in support of. Yes, yeah. it's a rally in support of harm re re reduction. Right. Right. And the way you, the, those were, I mean, obviously, if you say protest in the UK, they're still going to think of those crazy Americans that stormed the, the you know, uh, Capitol building here and you know I mean that's still fresh on everybody's mind so we don't want to use the word protest because the UK uh, has done it mostly right um, yes so we definitely don't I mean we we, we would be uh, much more beneficial in calling it a rally in support of and a thank you to the UK government or Public Health England uh, for being uh, smart yes <laughs> but, I mean, the the award that Bloomberg was given was. Uh, I hope they actually give it to him as well, because I mean, I'd like to say hi to the folks from Bath TR as well, yep. who I'm sure are watching, and Same. I'd like to let them know that uh, whatever happens, the wiki isn't going away, and. You know, it's not there because it's making money. It's there because it's needed. It's required. It's a resource. It yes. To be there. Yes. And, and we're Patrick, not motivated the, by huge resource. What was this, Kip? Isn't the next segment supposed to start in like seven minutes? Eight minutes. No, it's twenty-eight minutes. All I oh, know I is that I, I love it. Oh, let me let me look. I did. I did. I did beg. For extra they time they've seen our, they've <laughs> no, seen our the, show the, the next segment doesn't start until uh 11 our He's time or, uh, 11 on the, on the counter we still have we still have time uh they we don't i don't obviously want to be a hog and, and suck up all the time because they do have pre-recorded content that we're bumping um but uh it has been an amazing conversation and obviously we will continue we will continue to uh to converse um, Richard's been on the show now. Now that you understand that you can do the show, it's just that your internet sucks and you may have to uh, not turn your camera on. Um, you're going to come on the show and we're going to continue this conversation. And maybe Kath will actually show up um, in the on screen instead of in the chat room. Um, uh, I would... Uh, Hennage has actually sent me a private message and he wants to know what message would you like to pass on to the cop delegates richard i've already i've already passed on my message to the cop delegates i've actually got my mp to write a letter to them 
with my view that they should support vaping, that they need to change the way that the World Health Organization looks at harm reduction. I've asked for them to suggest the World Health Organization actually has a working party on harm reduction built into the system. Whether that will make any difference, I don't know. But yeah, I'm absolutely, I've, I've made sure to make it abundantly clear that something needs to change and it needs to change radically and harm reduction needs to be embraced, not completely ignored. Skip? Yes? What would you like to, 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 is there a message that you would like to pass on to the COP delegates, even though we're Americans and we're not signatories? Um, um, wor words are good. Words are good. You know, after surviving a lifetime of bullying and abuse and poverty, I'm 63 years old and for the first time in my life, I can look in the mirror and say, I'm a good person. And I think my life has value. Um, I think um, I'm a productive member of society. And I think that everybody who uses nicotine, be it smoking or an alternative product, their life matters. And you can pass all the flavor bans and taxes and other kinds of bans you want. You can't force the whole world to stop smoking. And the most compassionate thing you could do is value their life and make sure that these novel products have a place in the marketplace so that people like me can be a grandma and be a great grandma and donate to my food shelf and give a total stranger a hug on a day they need a hug. And what they're doing now is just literally forcing people to die. And I don't know how you can call yourself a health organization and not care about the lives of people who use nicotine. Kevin? Oh, are you sure you want me to yeah. do this? Oh, so, I'm going to fire. I'm, I've got. I've already got the barrels I'm, loaded. I know you make me follow these guys, and that's that's probably going to turn a little bit. I think if you're going to focus to those at uh, COP nine, if you're going to focus on taxes for the past thirty years or forty years, it's not worked. It hasn't dropped the smoking rates around the globe significantly enough to say, hey, let's keep doing it. So that tells me you like money. You really, really like the money and job security more than you care about the humans you're allegedly trying to allegedly serve that you won't allow in. So public and the media. So if you're going to be anti-tobacco, you're also anti-human. And you're not listening to the humans who keep telling you the same story from sea to shining sea and all around the globe so if you're going to be anti-tobacco just do that you're 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 gunning towards a faceless corporation or corporations and some of those corporations are countries they're not going anywhere kids how long have you been doing this smarten up so it is about the money it isn't about the humans that you're that you're forcing to have smoking or dying you're not telling the truth about nicotine and basically you all can kiss my ass that's that's my take on that sorry <laughs> don't be sorry <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um a lot of people a lot of people aren't aren't aware of this and um i don't know if h or paul or whoever's in the back room but i've just shared something if you if you have time slap that on the screen for me because uh, this this visual might be important it might be impactful for people to understand so um there's this thing that who calls m power 
And this is a program funded by, uh, well, am I am I calling him Lord Valdemort or am I calling him Michael Bloomberg? I, I, I there there is a there is an inside joke uh, amongst us uh, in the backstage area that we we've been calling uh, we've been calling him Lord Valdemort. But anyway, Empower are is a program. It's initiatives that the WHO are pushing all over the globe. And this is part of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It's uh, one of the things they're chatting about. Um, and nowhere in their program does it talk about um, studying nicotine. Does it Does it talk about uh, affecting change? Finding out why people use nicotine. Why do people use nic nicotine? We've we've been on this. We've been on here for an hour and forty minutes now, and we've we've told you um, that that's a very important factor in, in what you do. So, you know, you have this, you have the M in Empower is monitoring tobacco use. Well, you've been doing that. We know which demographics use. You know which demographics smoke. Um, you know where they live, why they do it. Uh, you've done socioeconomic analysis to understand that people in low economic situations, which means that they're probably... Um, nervous about where their next meal is coming from. Uh, nervous about uh, their husband beating them when they come home. Nervous about whether their kids will be able to have a roof over their head. These are all stressors. So people in that situation, they smoke to relieve the tension and the pressure of life. Because they have difficult ones. Then you have guys like us who use it to maintain an even keel to prevent us from going off the deep end from Richard or the lovely Skip for uh, prematurely ending their lives because they're using nicotine to smooth out the edges and to stay focused. I use it to prevent me from killing other people. I've never wanted to kill myself, but I have wanted to kill other people. Um, and nicotine calms me down and keeps me from doing that. Um, you have protecting people from tobacco smoke, which is a wonderful mission. Tobacco smoke is awful. It smells. I won't even try to argue that there's a thing called secondhand smoke. Um, and it can't be good. I mean, it's probably not nearly as bad as what many people think it is. It's not great. I mean, it. I mean, alone, it, it, it stinks. Um, as an ex-smoker, I can smell it like 100 feet away. So, yeah, uh, quitting tobacco, that's fine if you don't need it. And if you do need it, how about quitting smoking instead of quitting tobacco and offering alternatives? How about you could just add the word offering alternatives here? Um Warning about the dangers of smoking instead of tobacco because tobacco is not dangerous by itself. I mean, it's not it's not bad until you light it on fire, but it does have some uh, wonderful things that that happens. Um, enforcing tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship bans. We've done that here in the states. We've done that. Um, other countries they've done that. Plain packaging in Australia and other countries, and um, didn't make a blind bit of difference. Yes, not not a bit, not a bit. It, it, it's a it, it's a make work. It's a look what we did, and then here raising taxes on tobacco. Who do you think that fucking punishes? It's not the cigarette manufacturers. No, they're not paying the damn the taxes. The people who who earn low incomes and who don't have the money to spend on tobacco. Damn it. And would rather go without lunch and have yes, a cigarette. Exactly. Richard, Those are the people when, who when you were a smoker and you were stressed out and you had a choice between having a lunch or a smoke, you were oh, going to have a smoke. Cigarettes every time. Every time. So I look at you, WHO, and I wonder are you listening to us? Are you listening? Are you even caring? Do you even bother to speak to the people that you're that you're denigrating and punishing when you come up with these things? Are you sitting in a room, a sterile room, surrounded by other people that have nothing going on, that uh, 
uh, want to push and enforce their will upon other people. That's what you are. That is what you do. You don't care about happiness of other people. You don't care about people like me or Skip or Richard or Kevin's son or Kevin's wife or Kevin or uh, Shannon Brown in the chat room or Bruni or Leanna. You don't care about those people. You only care about enforcing your will upon other people. And we're tired of it. We are not going to sit quietly and let you uh, take away our choice. We're not going to let you take away our sanity because I will tell you, I will not go on the meds that they've prescribed for me. Richard has already chosen not to go on those meds. Skip has chosen to try to manage her problems without pharmaceuticals that turn us into mindless dolders that don't have any will that sit in a corner and and struggle with making a single decision because that's what these pills that you give us do we sit there and and struggle with taking one step towards a goal and without nicotine we would be in that situation. I wouldn't be able to sit here and have a tirade and yell at you and point out all of your uh, insane ideas about what I should do to maintain my sanity. So I'm tired of it. Richard's tired of it. Skip's tired of it. Kevin's tired of it. Leanna, Pippa, Bruni, Mallory, we're all fucking tired of it. We are not going to let you have the power over our lives and we are going to scream and point your hypocrisy out to the world. Anyway, I love you guys. Uh, appreciate it. I'm glad that you um, came on the show to tell your stories. I'm glad people watched it. I'm glad that, uh, that Scope uh, is allowing us to bring our stories out. Um, to an even bigger audience. And I hope, um, you know, uh, not to commercialize, but um, I hope that, that people that watch the Scope show that haven't, um, that haven't ever watched uh, Son of Liberty Radio, um, go to uh, your podcast app and type in hashtag Son, Son of Liberty Radio. You're going to find our audio show. If you uh, like YouTube, you can go onto YouTube and type in hashtag Son of Liberty. You're going to get Son of Liberty Radio. Don't forget the radio. You're going to get our shows. Um, go and click on one of our shows and like and follow our channel. Um, go to Smoke Free Radio Network on Facebook. We're there. And uh, follow Kevin on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Kevin is at Vaping It. And um, I am at Not Noir. Or just type in Twitter hashtag Son of Liberty. You'll find one of our tweets. Oh,